Yes, I see some people are still joining the session, but I think um, we can start. Uh, please feel free to uh, put on your camera, <laughs> everybody, so we can see your faces. Uh, as a notification, the, the lecture is being recorded, um, just so you know. Um, well, welcome everybody to our first uh, lecture in the SIP NL series on soft power, in which all of four SIP cities will be organizing one lecture around this theme. And tonight, uh, I, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Ms. Joke Brandt, the Dutch permanent representative to the United Nations in New York and former Secretary General of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and we will also uh, briefly hear from uh, Lisa de Pachter, who is a youth ambassador. Uh, so welcome, uh, Ms. Brandt. I would uh, like to give the floor to you. Right. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Joop. Uh, uh, and I guess it's good evening uh, on, uh, on your side. It's still the good afternoon here and a beautiful afternoon for that matter. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me and it's, uh, it's great to be part uh, of, this, uh, of this series. Um, I hope it's going to be an interactive discussion. I know it's kind of difficult with, uh, uh, on, on Zoom, but I guess by now we're all used to that with raising hands and all that. And I hope you, you will help me yeah, to, uh, to steer that if, uh, if necessary. Um, what I'd like to do is basically to, you know, to divide my, my, my talk in three parts. One is, um, I thought it was going to be interesting for you to sort of understand how I got here. So what was the path that I walked in order to become the PR in New York? Um, second part on, you know, what's up at the UN right now, what it's like working there, what are the main issues? And then three, also linking up a little bit on the um, on the, the theme of soft power that sort of connects this uh, this series, a little bit on um, soft power uh, and uh, and UN. And finally, I was also asked to share some uh, accomplishments and 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 challenges at um, at the very end. As uh, you said, um, we are joined um, by um, by Lisa Lisa de Parte, our youth ambassador. So. Lisa, maybe you can unmute and, uh, and briefly introduce yourself so that everybody knows who you are and what you look like. Definitely. Thanks, Yoka. Um, hi, everyone. It's so good to be here, and I'm super happy to share some of the speaking time together with our ambassador. Um, yeah, I think Yoka said it very well. I'm the youth ambassador specifically for sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender equality, and bodily autonomy. Um, it's quite a unique and a special position that I have within the ministry, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it after. But I think if we're talking about soft power, um, it's definitely uh, a super interesting thing to talk about. And, uh, you know, I always very much vouch for meaningful youth participation. So for Yoka to be sharing her time with me right now, I think is a perfect example of that. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And indeed, uh, we'll be hearing more from you uh, later on. So um, everybody, my name is Joke Brandt um, and I'm now the permanent representative of the Kingdom of the Netherlands uh, at the UN here in New York, but um, uh, originally from, um, uh, from uh, Rotterdam. Uh, I was always uh, uh, really interested in, in global issues uh, and development issues. And so um, I left Rotterdam to study geography of developing countries in, at the University of Utrecht and also did a major on development economics at Erasmus Uni University and international relations at the University of Amsterdam. But, you know, this question, I've been asked this question many times, but I mean, when I started, I really didn't have a fixed plan to become a, to become a diplomat. Actually, I started working for um, uh, SNV which is a, a Dutch development uh, organization, uh, first in Kenya and then uh, after that in Uganda. Uganda, you know, right at the end of the civil war that, um, that plagued the country for so many years. And it was while working in Uganda that people actually got me interested in diplomacy and working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, so I applied, then enrolled in the diplomatic training and after that worked uh, uh, in The Hague in, in some positions, but mostly in, um, in, in Africa. I was lucky enough 
to serve in South Africa during the democratic transition, which I think was absolutely the best time ever to be there, very, very uh, uh, exciting. Um, I was also ambassador in Eritrea when um, the uh, Netherlands participated in a peacekeeping mission there uh, during the war between Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea. And then I went back to Uganda again, um, not for SMFA, but, uh, but as the ambassador uh, there. And it was really great to be there, you know, for a second time, because you can see how much the country progressed in some ways and didn't progress at all in other ways uh, in the course of these, these 10 plus years. From Uganda, I was then called back uh, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I was Director General for um, International Cooperation for almost five years uh, before moving here to New York, where I worked for, um, uh, for UNICEF. Uh, that was actually a great uh, experience and obviously very, very useful for my, um, uh, for my current uh, job. Then, as um, uh, you just said, after UNICEF, I went back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as um, a Secretary General until uh, I arrived here in New York uh, in September uh, last year. So before moving on, I just like to check maybe with one or two or three of you, is there anybody who has been thinking about working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or for the UN? Who? I see bus. <laughs> and Kaisa, yeah. Please, Buzz, and then Kaisa. Oh, yeah, I, I, I've been thinking working for, uh, but I'm still doing my bachelor's, so I'm not sure, but it sounds very interesting and like a super cool experience. So, yeah. Um, uh, what would... For the, for the, the Klingendal uh, Institute. Uh, the All right. And what would be your main sort of, I know it's early days, but what would be your main sort of, um, what would be the pool, so to speak, for working <laughs> in that field? So honestly, that's why I came to this talk because I'm not sure if I want to maybe work in The Hague or maybe also in New York. Uh, so I'm uh -huh. super interested in your experiences and, and maybe I decide after this. Uh -huh. Okay, well, that's a heavy responsibility on my <laughs> shoulders. <laughs> but don't hesitate uh, to ask uh, also later in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A, whatever you want. Uh, I think I saw also saw Kaisa. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> Yes, I suppose it's always been my dream to become a diplomat one day. Um, personally, I, I actually lived in Kenya before, so I'm really intrigued to hear more about that from you. Oh, yeah. And that's also where I'm hoping to, well, be, be located and be working in Africa in the, in the future. Yeah, no, I can, I mean, I've spent uh, over, I think, almost 15 years in Africa altogether. Uh, and uh, I, I can tell you it is an amazingly diverse and uh, exciting and in some ways inspiring uh, continent to work in. I'm not one of those people that, you know, says, well, you've already been to Kenya, so uh, why would you want to move to South Africa or Uganda? They're all completely, completely different. Uh, Zaya? Hi, uh, probably not in foreign embassy, uh, foreign affairs, because I'm not, not yet a Dutch citizen. I'm from China. Uh -huh. But I'm working in HR and looking forward to be an HR in IO, so in the future sometime. All right. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, 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 thanks for that. So um, we'll move back to uh, we'll move back to New York uh, then. So as I said, I arrived in uh, in September uh, last year, and you know, actually, also nice maybe to share that I'm the first female permanent representative of the uh, uh, Netherlands in 75 years. So that uh, shows you that uh, internationally, the Netherlands has a great reputation when it comes to gender and you know, women's empowerment uh, issues, but um, there is still a lot of work to do, including in our own country, in uh, my own ministry and in the, and in the in the UN, and this is really one of the issues I'm very passionate about. So, if there's any questions on that, I'd be more be with them, willing to uh, to respond. It's also, I think, uh, important to realize that it is actually uh, the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands because we also represent, you know, the Caribbean part 
in our kingdom, so Aruba, Curaçao, and, uh, and St. Martin. And for them, also, the UN is very important, for instance, when it comes to issues of climate change. And now in the, uh, with COVID, you know, the impact that it has on the tourism industry and um, uh, the, the whole um, situation uh, with their, um, with their uh, income. So, you know, September 2020 was going to be a really important month for the UN. It was um, the 75th uh, anniversary because, of course, the, uh, the organization was founded after the Second World War in 1945. And um, you know, big celebrations were planned through, throughout the year, but especially at what is called the high level week, which is always the third week of September, you know, when world leaders all flock to New York for the, for the, general, for the general debate. And when you know, the whole city is sort of, New Yorkers don't like it very much because the whole city is taken over by uh, by diplomats, uh, the hotels, uh, many receptions, uh, unexpected bilaterals, and all that. It's uh, it, it's quite a, uh, an exciting time normally, but of course, um, in March uh, last year, uh, COVID hit, and uh, it hit New York very hard. I mean, I think most of you will remember that the shocking images that we got from New York by uh, by that time. So. When I arrived in September, um, the situation was that the United Nations and basically all the other permanent missions here were working fully virtually. So there was none of the hustle and bustle, you know, no talking in the corridors, no um, impromptu meetings between world leaders. Um, but, uh, 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 you know, basically after two weeks of quarantine, my first job was to sit in this huge, virtually empty uh, General Assembly hall and introduce the pre-recorded messages of King Willem Alexander and Prime Minister Rutte. I can assure you, not the most exciting thing um, to do if you compare it to a normal situation. So um, I think that was, of course, for the UN, especially a big uh, disappointment because they had obviously sort of worked for the 75th anniversary and the celebrations for, for, for years. But I must say, I was surprised by um, how things just kept on going, uh, albeit uh, virtually. Um, as maybe this whole way of virtual, working virtually, I think affects um, the work here in the UN in many ways. But let me mention two. I think you know it's fair when people say that this virtual working basically takes the soul out of, uh, out of diplomacy, because the diplomacy is what we call a contact sport. It is uh, about meeting people, it's about listening, it's about understanding, about influencing. Um, and we can, it's, that's what we call maybe soft power. We can talk about that uh, a little bit later. And so that all fell by the wayside. On the other hand, as I said, it is working. And although, you know, the endless Zoom meetings, just sitting behind the screen the whole day and do join meeting and leave meeting uh, is, uh, is quite, quite exhausting and not exactly you know, what one would have expected uh, of this work in uh, New York. Um, it is working and I really wouldn't, have, no, wouldn't know how we would have been able to do this like 10 years ago when we would not have all these um, technical uh, possibilities and opportunities. And as I said, this is uh, clearly a, a, second, a second best. And I think we're all very, very eager to go back in, 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 to in-person meetings. I told uh, my colleague from Libya yesterday, um, it feels sometimes as if I'm still doing this very long preparation for the, for the real job. Although you're working basically very long hours, it still feels like you know, the real work has not begun Yet and he had the, and he had the same feeling. I do hope that um, we will be able when we go back to sort of in person to retain some of what we've learned about these virtual ways of working um, during the pandemic. I mean, this is a clear example of uh, uh, of how you can, can connect virtually. It would have been impossible. Oh, 
maybe not for all of you to come to New York. Maybe not. We can uh, we can always uh, try to see if that would work. But another example is um, we recently had a meeting with Microsoft. So Microsoft is in Seattle. We were here in New York and we were joined by somebody in uh, The Hague. And this, basically this was a one-off meeting. So it was not long, a, a series of meetings. So it enabled us to connect and either that meeting would otherwise not have taken place or it would have been at ridiculous costs of people flying, uh, flying across the Atlantic to join in. The second point is, and that's really a personal sort of point, I, I really found it difficult to start a new job uh, under these conditions because you have no, um, no meetings, no receptions, no events where you would normally get to know people easily. Huh? You go to reception, you're there for an hour, you meet uh, 25 colleagues. And now even the, the, the courtesy calls that I was doing with UN, UN officials and with my colleagues were all uh, virtual. And like I said, that feels a little bit um, uh, bizarre. Even more difficult, I thought it was that uh, also at the, at the mission here, we were working mainly virtual. So it was much more hard to get to know my own colleagues here, to, to be a team uh, together. And up to now, we have not really been able to meet all together at the same time because of all the restrictions uh, that apply. And then in a way, I was lucky because, I mean, I already knew uh, the UN from my time in UNICEF, uh, and I knew many people uh, in the UN, and I knew uh, the city. Although um, I think it's fair to say that New York is really visibly scarred uh, by, the, by the pandemic, but I mean, it's good to know uh, how the city sort of works and, uh, and, and, and functions. So I found that really hard. Um, well, things are improving uh, in New York, as you may have heard, with the vaccinations, uh, the rate of vaccination is, uh, is, is incredible. And it's fair to say, I think that most of the people at the mission, including the younger colleagues, have had, had at least one shot. So we'll, um, we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to go back to in person at any time. At the same time, you have to realize that as a really special responsibility that rests upon the UN because it's 193 countries. Um, and, you know, to just allowing um, in-person meetings again would also, of course, have the terrible risk that one of these 193 countries might bring the virus to, to New York. And just imagine also the reputational risk of the UN, you know, being accused of being, you know, the source of a new, uh, uh, of a new, uh, epicenter for the epidemic. Now, the work um, at the UN in, in the past six or seven months has basically by dominated, but has been dominated with what I call the three C's. So COVID is, you know, front and center at the agenda. Uh, I mean, of course, that's 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 incredibly important also for the UN to try and see how we can get a better multilateral response to and pandemic, which by its very nature, you cannot solve uh, nationally. The other issue is uh, climate, the sea of climate. Uh, there's a, a number of very important meetings taking place also uh, later this year uh, in, uh, uh, in the COP26 in, uh, in the UK. And well, I mean, it's great, of course, to have the US back uh, in, uh, in that group. And I think some of you may have heard that uh, President Biden already organized last week a high level summit on uh, on climate so that is a real real big difference and the third c is um, is for conflict um, uh, obviously that dominates the agenda of the security council but basically also impacts on the on the rest of the work of the un you know be it the development work or the peacekeeping work and we are involved as the netherlands in all these discussions um, because of the, 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 the interest of these issues in itself, but also because uh, it's in our interest to sort of work for multilateral solutions for these really global uh, global problems that like I said, cannot be resolved through national policies only. Besides that, um, the Netherlands is also a member of the Peacebuilding Commission. And this morning, just before 
joining you. Um, we had a meeting on the on the Sahel and what is happening there in terms of conflict. Uh, you know the the great danger from uh, extremism and the, the the devastating impact this has on the on the population uh, and the humanitarian situation there. We're also vice president of the board of um, uh, the United Nations Development Program, uh, which is one of the reasons that I have to leave you a little early, like 10 minutes before three here, yeah, because I have to chair uh, a meeting uh, of that group. And we just did, um, uh, as an example, our share of proper UN heavy lifting work, as it's called, by uh, negotiating uh, an outcome document on uh, on finance, and we can talk about all of this more in the Q&A if you want to, or if anybody has a question right now on, uh, on this and on the specific work of the UN, please raise your hand. You can raise your hand by the uh, reaction button at the bottom of your screen, by the way. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I see a uh, bus, yeah. So thanks for that introduction. Um, that's already super interesting. Uh, I was wondering, since you're, as a representative, you have to cover so many things. Um, I was wondering how big is the, is the Dutch mission at the UN? Is it one of the bigger ones or uh, relatively small? Um, no, it's actually sort of medium-sized. Um, I, I think we are, can consider ourselves lucky because we've got the uh, uh, a, a good team, uh, good people, but uh, I think also, well, you can always take on more, of course, but uh, enough uh, uh, enough people to for, for the size of the country that we are. Obviously, the really big ones are, you know, the permanent five, so the UK, the US, uh, uh, the Russian Federation, China, these have enormous uh, missions, and the Netherlands is a little bit in the same league as big bigger than the Scandinavian uh, than the Scandinavian countries, particularly Sweden, Denmark, and Finland are smaller, but we're of course very like-minded and focusing mainly on the same uh, on the same issues. And we actually have a mix of, um, of course, uh, uh, the colleagues that uh, that that work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as diplomats, but we also employ people uh, uh, locally if they have a specific skill. Um, that that we need. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, then we'll uh, then we'll uh, we'll we'll move on because I thought it was interesting to say a few words on on soft power and uh, and and the UN and of course you know uh, basically the essence of soft power is that you get others on your side that you get others to also want the outcomes that you want, but without um, uh, coercion or payment, but through persuasion, through attraction. And I think um, it is um, interesting that some people are very skeptical of soft power. They only believe in hard power. Uh, famously, uh, Joseph Stalin once uh, dismissed soft power by asking how many troops um, the Pope had. Uh, and I think that's clearly a um, uh, true underestimation of, uh, the, you know, of soft power, because if you can just imagine the influence and the power that the Pope has, then, I mean, I think he clearly didn't understand what uh, uh, the soft power can, uh, can achieve. So uh, the UN um, is, of course, a, a really different, a different animal. And I think it is fair to say that if you want to get consensus among 193 countries, it is practically only possible through uh, soft power. The point obviously is it takes time and it is often uh, value driven. I mean, it depends on, on the offer you put on the table, basically. And very often, you know, for the Netherlands and like minded countries, the offer we put on the table is democracy, human rights, uh, development. And I mean, that's not always uh, the narrative that others want to buy, want to buy into. Um, so the interesting question is also, I think, how much power the UN 
actually is and has only has there's only one answer to the question the un only has as much power as it can borrow from the member states because it has no uh, own uh, forces and it has a relatively small budget so what you see is that when the member states the big powers agree uh, then the un can have hard power even as you saw for instance in 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 korea in the in the 50s and it has soft power when member states disagree but do not stand in the way of the un taking action on something so they basically uh you know shut up and let it go but they and it has very little power when especially the big powers don't agree or uh, oppose action or choose um to to basically ignore the sort of fundamental values and rights that i was just talking about and that is actually what you see play out in the security council because what you see there you know the five permanent members and the 10 non-permanent members it's all about the p5 the permanent five and you see the geopolitical tensions that exist between the U.S. and uh, Russian Federation, between uh, the U.S. and uh, China and some of the other members of the Council. And you see that that very often leads to paralysis uh, and, uh, and, and the stalemate and the Security Council being unable to agree, even when it comes to humanitarian issues where there used to be, uh, you know, when the geopolitical tensions were not so high, it was easier to at least get agreement on humanitarian issues. And even that is difficult these days. For instance, humanitarian access in a country like Syria, it took forever for the council to agree on anything. And now you see also in Myanmar that it's very difficult to, to get to, to concrete, concrete actions. And these, these sort of geopolitical tensions that you see in the Security Council also plays out, play out in the wider work of the United Nations. So to just give an example of how that sometimes work is, the Netherlands always um, pushes every year uh, a resolution on uh, uh, violence against women. And uh, we do that together with France, that is usually full agreement on that issue. So it means that the, the resolution doesn't have to be tabled for voting, but it's adopted by consensus. And this year, sort of out of the blue, the Russian Federation asked for a vote, just, you know, not for any sort of substantive reason, but just, you know, to block, to frustrate uh, the process. Of course, the, the resolution was adopted but it just shows you how these geopolitics also get into the into the works of the um, of the un so um maybe um one or two examples of how we have used soft power as the netherlands you know it's very often said that the, the sort of the middle powers so that's the netherlands uh, the scandinavian countries canada australia new zealand that these are the countries that know how to use their soft power and how to leverage that soft power. So that basically means that we're able to punch above our weights because very often we're not big enough, you know, to be mistrusted immediately by the big powers, and we're not we're, uh, we're and we're big enough, you know, to to leverage and and use our our influence. And we do that very often on um, issues that are sensitive, so are difficult for other countries to pick up. So as an example, the Netherlands chairs, co-chairs with Argentina, the LGBTI core group at the UN. And of course, obviously that is a very sensitive issues, uh, issue. And only, the only thing you can do is uh, explain, understand, persuade. So what we've actually done we've had put together a positive agenda so that uh, it's not all about criticizing each other, but more about trying to find a uh, middle ground. And we've made sure that it is cross-regional. So we have countries from all uh, continents. And what you see is that, you know, countries are then more willing to join if they know they're not immediately being criticized for whatever position they take up. And a, a, a thing I think that always works very well is to always acknowledge 
your own challenges. So when it comes to like LGBTI issues or you know, uh, gender issues to acknowledge that we've come a long way and we're not there ourselves yet either. So we understand that you need to make baby steps and you cannot kind of sort of make a big leap in, uh, in one go because in these kind of issues, you know, the moral, taking the moral high ground doesn't actually work. You'll not get people uh, on board. Of course, sometimes when it comes to more uh, human rights like issues, you have to use uh, a mix of, of soft and, uh, and, and hard power if you, if you can't get there through persuasion, because basically you don't share the same value system. And that's what you see. We have a very difficult discussion right now, of course, with China about the issue of the, of the Uyghurs, the Uyghur. Uh, and there, that is a mix of persuasion, but also sometimes sanctions. And in other cases, uh, we use the, uh, the International Criminal Court or very uh, more recently, uh, Minister Bloch has also called Syria out for uh, 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 breaching the, the United Nations Convention Against Torture. So that's a combination uh, uh, of the two. Uh, another example of more soft power is when you introduce a new issue in the United uh, Nations, always very complicated because it's not in any previous statement, it's not in any previous resolution, and so you'll really have to uh, work with member states to uh, convince them that this is worth you know, uh, putting, putting on the agenda. That happened with um, the, the big uh, emphasis that we've had on mental health and psychosocial support, especially in crisis situations, and you know, even more important now with COVID, where we, since last year, September, organized numerous events and discussions to basically get influential member states on board and also the UN agencies. And it's then always gratifying to see that indeed we managed to launch a call of action with six uh, main UN uh, uh, agencies promising that they would pay more attention to mental health and psychosocial support in their, uh, in their interventions. So this is a little bit how we try to work with this soft power. But maybe, Lisa, this is the right um, moment to, um, to give you the floor and, and, and tell a little bit about how you are using soft power in your work as, uh, as youth ambassador. Perfect. Thank you, Oka. Um, all right, let's see. I think I might start off the same way that Yoka did um, and tell a little bit about how I got here and then I'll talk a little bit about my, what my position um, entails specifically. So I've always had a really big interest in global affairs. Um, I went to Leiden University College and I also volunteered at a youth organization called Choice for Youth and Sexuality uh, for four years. Um, they fight for reproductive rights and youth participation. And I was an intern at the UN in New York as well at uh, the United Nations Population Fund. So not at the Dutch mission there, but rather a UN agency. Um, and if I can give you any advice, if you want to intern with the UN, don't go to New York. It's not fun. It's very hierarchical. Go to a field office. But, you know, that's just my, my take on that. Um, and then in August, I started this new role as youth ambassador, uh, youth ambassador for sexual and re reproductive health and rights gender equality and bodily autonomy specifically. Um, it's above all a mouthful, I think, so let's just keep it at Youth Ambassador. But it's a very unique position because I am integrated within the ministry. Um, so I really sit in on the meetings and I help develop our development policy specifically. But I'm also independent and that means that I get to be critical of the policies that we make internally and externally. Um, a little bit more critical even than our own uh, diplomats can. So I have a little bit of my, my soft power of myself. Um, and I've always been a bit on the fence, right? About where my efforts for change are best in place, specifically those efforts for, for gender equality. Um, I am really passionate about gender equality and, and reproductive rights. It's something that's always really driven me and that I've always found really interesting, especially when it comes to, to international relations. Um, and if you look at the division of that power, uh, if you want to make a change and if you're passionate about something, I think on one hand, as part of a civil society organization, so an NGO or a company, 
you can really be loud about the topics that you want to influence and that you care about and you don't have to be as diplomatic. But on the other hand, as a government, you really have the larger power, right? The real decision-making power. Um, but you have to be more diplomatic, obviously. Um, and so I've been at the ministry since August. And I think the more I work there, the more I realize that we can actually call the Netherlands an activist as well. Uh, we have a range of topics that we're seriously passionate about. Um, and I think that's where the theme of, of soft power comes in very nicely. It's always a little bit taboo, I think, to talk about a government as an activist. Uh, but when it comes to reproductive rights or youth participation or women's rights, we haven't really, you know, we, we're not really afraid to speak out about that multilaterally. Uh, we really leave our mark, I think, as a relatively tiny country. Um, and I think as Yoka said as well, the UN has barely any hard power, but still most of the work that we do um, at the UN is there to shape sort of global norms and the way that we think about things and the way that we appreciate themes that really um, keep us busy from day to day. Um, but even as a small country, we get to leave that mark. Um, and I think as of late, and I think you touched upon that as well, Yoka, we have to be activists on some topics. I think over the past couple of years, we've really seen growing pushback on gender equality and reproductive rights in, in multilateral spaces like the UN and the EU. Um, and normally, for example, the UN member states would always make new global commitments to gender equality um, every year, but now we have to fight harder and harder every time to protect the gains that we've made. And I think that's kind of worrying um, because it does really show that there's a trend ongoing and that we have to keep on fighting for the things that we really stand for. Um, but we do, and that's good because we keep on win winning and we keep sort of bringing more people together and countries together that also share our, our values. Um, and so for me as youth ambassador, it's really special to also be sitting in on those topics and on those, on those developments um, because I'm only 22, but the Netherlands also really show that youth participation and meaningful youth participation specifically is very important to them. And, you know, they're like, well, we can't be making policies about young people if we don't actually have young people involved in the policy making of that. And they're like, well, we, we can do this with our own people. I think that the average age at the ministry is 55. Um, so they were like, well, you know, we can't, we can't, you know, tell ourselves that we know what happens in the daily lives of a young person from Eritrea or from Colombia. So let's actually involve young people themselves. And that's why I'm there to do that. But also, um, you know, we have a lot of embassies that, that have made it a standard practice um, to really involve young people from, from civil society in their daily work. And I think that's really special. I think we're actually, you know, quite um, cutting edge when it comes to that. Um, and I think, yeah, like I said, the, the, the fact that a position like mine even exists is testimony to our identity as a government uh, internationally. Um, and I know I have to be mindful of the time, so I'll just leave my last remark. Um, I think, you know, the fact that I get to help shape our multilateral efforts, um, but also share this, this time with yoga right now, it just goes to show that we're not afraid to make a statement. Um, yeah, so that's it for now from, from me, but maybe we have some questions afterwards. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. And uh, I really fully agree with you on uh, on the pushback that we've seen over the last couple of years on issues that we as the Netherlands find really important when it comes to sexual reproductive health and rights, women's rights, human rights more in, uh, more in, in, in general. And again, it is uh, interesting to see how the uh, change in administration in the United States is already also um, influencing uh, uh, that uh, debate where particularly, for instance, on sexual reproductive health and rights, they were using their not so soft power to um, um, basically entice countries in the middle to join their camp, so to speak. And well, it's a complete, it's a complete different uh, arena there. And I must honestly say that although, of course, you know what was happening multilaterally, I was uh, still shocked when I saw, you know, resolutions on, for instance, issues on sexual reproductive health and rights, and then voting against were Saudi Arabia, Iran, 
Venezuela and uh, in more of these countries. And then you saw the US there. It was completely bizarre to, 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 to get that experience. But um, that, um, well, in that sense, we're moving in, uh, in, the, right, uh, in the right direction. Um, I think, you know, we also had the uh, last month, the Commission on the Status uh, of Women, where uh, we really um, felt that, you know, at least we can't lose ground. I mean, maybe this is not the right time to make, you know, like enormous strides forwards, but we at least have to stand our ground and, uh, and hopefully make a little bit of progress too. And so, yes, then sometimes you do become a little bit of an activist, uh, as, as Lisa said. So I don't know any questions now for me or for Lisa before we move to the accomplishments and challenges. Maya? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, maybe we will also discuss this in the next part, but I was wondering if there are examples of when you use soft power in your day-to-day -day job that you are proud of or that you want to share or that stood out to you? Maybe that's a nice question for Lisa as well. Yeah, Lisa, why don't you uh, why don't you kick off? Yeah, I think I have a perfect answer to your question. Um, <laughs> so yes, last month we had the CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women, which is a yearly recurring theme that countries come together for, and they yeah, that's what I just said. Like they come together and and shape those global norms that you know the way that we think about the status of women and gender equality, and the theme was um, participation of women and girls. And because I am the youth ambassador also for gender equality, um, the government invited me to be part of the, the actual national delegation, which is the first time that a young person was part of the delegation to CSW. So that was very special in itself. And then I actually got the opportunity to um, introduce some new language. I don't know if you guys are familiar with how that works, but like I said, the countries come together and they negotiate for weeks on a text. And that text then is the basis of how we think about the size of women other, other countries like sign off at the end of the week after really tough like political <laughs> negotiations it really gets intense um and so i introduced some uh some new language that uh, was about the participation of young women and girls specifically and what we need to do to make sure that young people can meaningfully engage in political processes and it made it into the text because netherlands introduced it and then the countries negotiated about it and in the end in the final product it stayed in there, right? So that's the way that I actually got to influence global ways of, of how we think about young women. I mean, for me, saying it right now, that's insane. What? Did that really happen, right? So, and I think that that is just, you know, something that we can really be proud of, that we also give that space to young people to, to actually do that. No, I think that's a really that's a really good example, and it comes big and small. Like you know, in the UN, uh, in the UN context, actually introducing new language is quite a big, it's quite a big thing. But it happens also on a on a day to day basis. For instance, when I sit together with a colleague and try to sort of um, get him on my side uh, and not uh, uh, be difficult in 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 a complicated negotiation. But as I said, it takes time so you know you soft power takes time you can't you need to build up relations you need to invest in understanding the other's point of view otherwise you won't be able to use the right arguments to persuade people uh, to 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 join you so um it, it's sometimes also frustrating because it if you're a little bit more activist and it takes long then but like i said when you're with 193 countries basically this way of using soft power is the only way to get consensus because, like I said, in the Security Council, where it's more hardball, they're completely paralyzed and, and can't agree uh, on, on, on virtually anything. So, and it's also a little bit, the, um, it's also a little bit part of the diplomacy game. You know, you start enjoying and sort of seeing like, okay, how can I get this one on board? Who else can talk to that person? And it's, um, yeah, it, it's, um, and then when it works, of course, then uh, that, that, that's a great feeling, even when you're not the youth ambassador, but just uh, the ambassador, <laughs> Lisa, for me, it still feels like a victory as well. 
<laughs> Anybody else? All right, then um, we'll move to the uh, to the last uh, bit, um, and I think we've we've already talked about most of this in my in my presentation. Uh, so what are uh, what are the, the the most important accomplishments and and challenges? I think you know uh, I'm actually most proud of how we managed to, to stay together as a team uh, during these very very difficult circumstances. Um, and you know uh, it, it it was really uh, tough uh, in uh, in New York and how we also managed to to really deliver. Um, uh, and achieve results despite these difficult circumstances. Of course, like I said, uh, we have a fantastic uh, uh, team here uh, in, uh, uh, in New York. And for instance, as a small example, uh, we managed to organize in March a very successful um, event with the Department of Peace Operations on the, uh, on the peacekeeping agenda. And again, this is also using soft power because we had put into our minds that we wanted it to be a different, non-traditional UN event. You know, you've got these UN events where you get endless statements, you know, you have five presenters and then you have pre-prepared statements by 20 member states. And, you know, after the second statement, everybody starts checking, uh, checking uh, the phone and isn't paying attention anymore. Oh, you actually see it on the on the screen right now. Um, we managed to, um, to do it uh, differently. You can see we created a sort of virtual studio uh, up there. Uh, we didn't do any um, uh, statements, uh, but made um, a, small, um, uh, a small video where everybody had 30 seconds to speak. And we had music both from the Netherlands to start with and from South Sudan where we uh, had uh, a group of young people also um, uh, performing uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, this, this event. So um, that is basically, I think, the most in, important uh, uh, point uh, that I'm really proud of my, of my team. Um, a little bit uh, like what we just discussed uh, after six, seven months here, I'm also really proud of how we are recognized for our ability to deal with sensitive issues. Again, um, it was the United States who approached us and said, well, you know, we've been out of this arena of sexual reproductive health and rights for four years. Now we'd like to come back. Um, and so how do you advise what, what, what should we do? And the same for LGBTI issues. So it means that we have sort of that profile that people feel that, you know, as the Netherlands, we are able to deal uh, with sensitive issues in a way um, that actually pushes the issue forward rather than creating complications. And then at a personal level, uh, I'm also proud um, uh, uh, that uh, together with uh, 49 other uh, female ambassadors, we uh, drafted uh, an OPAD uh, on, and it came after the Commission on the Status of Women, basically on um, the exact issue that we spoke about, that we need to not uh, be content with this situation where we're getting pushback on these issues, but um, um, keep on fighting. Uh, oh, and here you actually see uh, all 49 female uh, ambassadors on this picture. And that again, it's kind of a, a snapshot uh, uh, of what the UN looks like. I think you can clearly see that all regional groups, all continents, all uh, uh, religions basically are represented here. So it feels really very powerful to be able to do something, you know, with, the, uh, with this group of women. And we managed to uh, get it published also in, in various international newspapers in the US, in Italy, in France. So that at a personal level, I thought that was basically really cool <laughs> to, get that, uh, to get that done. Then uh, the biggest challenge is obviously the other side of the, of the coin. So how are we going to keep the spirits up and uh, deliver results under these very difficult circumstances that we're working in? 
you know, I think you will, all of you will also recognize that everybody's tired of Zoom meetings. And, you know, we are really, everybody wants to go back to uh, normal in-person meetings. And although, as I said, the situation is improving here uh, in, uh, in New York, I mean, uh, it's still, I don't think, for instance, that UN will be able to go back to in-person meetings for at least, well, I mean, a couple of months, maybe half a year, even because of that big risk that they uh, face if they if they are basically ahead of the curve, they will be. They will on this. They will be behind the curve and be very very uh, strict. So, so to basically to keep up the spirits um, and uh, that that will just need to c carry on with this for another couple of months. And the other challenge that we have is, you know, it's 193 countries here. I don't know how many UN organizations. There is always, every hour of every day, something happening. And most of it, not all, but most of it is exciting. And you think, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to do that. I'd like to join. Maybe we should take a leading role here and there. But we also have to realize, of course, that we have limited capacity. So we have to keep on focusing because I mean, in New York, you can, I mean, we could be basically working like 24 seven and still uh, on mainly very, very interesting issues. So uh, we've got the whole range, like I said, of, of, of issues here from nuclear disarmament to humanitarian aid to human, uh, to human rights. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's the, the possibilities here are are endless, but of course you've got to take into account how much you can bear as a as a team. So, Lisa, maybe do you want to share one of your accomplishments? You've already did that basically, right, with the uh, CSW. But maybe you have another one, and maybe also one challenge that you're facing in 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 your work as youth ambassador. Sure. Um... Accomplishments. See, this was an easy one because it's some, it's one of, that's really proud of and, and that went really well, but there was a lot of work that went into that. So as I'm talking, I'll think of if I can find another uh, easy accomplishment to, to talk about. I think challenges, there are plenty, especially as a young woman. Um, I think my position is really unique uh, because I'm independent and I get to be critical, but the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is still a big ministry with a lot of people. Um, that have their files and then I come barging in there and saying, hey, I, need to, I, I think something of this, you need to listen to me, right? So I think at first, a lot of people didn't find it that easy that this position existed, even though it's existed for about six years and I'm the fifth youth ambassador um, to be in office, let's say. Um, and especially with COVID, so a big par portion of my position is actually to really go abroad a lot and talk to young people in their country, talk about what their life experiences are and their lived realities, bring that back to The Hague so that we can incorporate it in our development policy. Obviously, since I started in August, I haven't been able to travel at all. And I haven't been able to go abroad and actually see what people go through and how the Netherlands can help in making that better for them and help them in their issues or you know, make their lives a little bit more prosperous in any way. Um, and that's tough because that meant that I had to find other ways to do that and to actually represent those people. And so I, a question that I get a lot is, how do you reach the people that don't have internet access if you're bound to you know, social media? And my answer is, I can't, I, I can't do oh. that. But at the same time, it's those people that don't have internet access that are like in the most rural parts of their country that have the biggest issues with, with accessing anything really that would benefit from me representing them to the Netherlands and, you know, so that we can just think about that. Um, and of course, I'm the first one to be in this position while it's COVID. So it's, it's tough to deal with that. Um, and I try to do my best. And what I've really tried to focus on, instead of doing that and trying to sort of represent them what I can't, is go back inside the ministry and look what can still be done within the ministry and how, um, we as a government can involve young people broadly, more broadly than me just as a youth ambassador, because I am just one young person and I have an expertise on gender equality and reproductive rights. But I think a lot of colleagues just see me as a young person and they're like, oh wait, but you're young. We can use you for anything. And I'm like, no, I don't know anything about environmental policy. 
Um, so I think I've tried to take it back within the ministry and, and take it a little bit broadly and it's been working and I'm very critical. People appreciate that. So that's good. <laughs> um, but it's not always easy. Thanks. Um, thanks, Lisa. Basically, this um, this is what uh, I had sort of um, in my head to to share with um, to share with you. So now, if there's any any sort of questions or comments that you'd like to make, please let's use the remaining time to uh, to uh, to have uh, to have that interactive discussion. If you if you have a question, you can raise your hand again by the uh, reaction button. Um, I had a question for Ambassador Brandt. Um, you've also been an ambassador to, I believe it was Uganda and Eritrea. Um, what are the key differences uh, with your current role and a norm normal, so to say, ambassadorship to a country? Yeah, you know, it is, uh, it is very different. Uh, I enjoyed both being an ambassador in, in Uganda and being an ambassador in Eritrea. But in a way, the bilateral work is uh, less hectic, you know, because your main, uh, your main job is the relation with that government and that country. And so uh, in both of these countries, I had this real drive to sort of uh, say, well, there's not going to be anybody who understands this country better than I do. But it's like more a one issue thing. Uh, the diplomatic community is also much smaller here in the UN, basically the first thing you can do is you can throw your agenda out of the window because it never, uh, it never goes as, as planned. Like I said, there's always something coming up, things coming, uh, coming up last minute. So you've got your agenda for the week and then all of a sudden the US decides to organize this and you are being asked to speak. So you have to turn. So it's, um, uh, and like I said, it is with 193 countries and the scope of issues and all these UN organizations, it's much more, um, uh, the range of issues is much, is much broader and your, um, uh, your networking capabilities uh, are, um, uh, are also put on the stress because again, the number of interlocutors, the number of people you need to know, the number of people that you need to build up a relation with is far bigger than in, in a bilateral setting. Thank you. Um, I see uh, a question from Jasper. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your interesting, uh, interesting talk. Uh, you talked a little bit about how the UN functions during COVID times. Uh, what do you think that the UN should be, uh, continue to do? Uh, what, what should be a learning point, a learning thing from COVID uh, these last couple of, of months to, uh, to change uh, the United Nations for better uh, in the future? You mean in the way that the, the, the Institute itself functions, right? Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, what um, uh, for the UN, what, what is a, a challenge is it's, of course, a member state driven organization. And I think one of the things they should try to do is um, to use you know, technology to make meetings a little bit more interactive, you know, to have the possibility to, it's not always easy, but like you know, when we had the meeting on the Sahel this morning, you're able to just link in you know, people in Niger and in Burkina Faso and in Senegal uh, to hear uh, the, the perspectives basically from the different countries. And I think because of, uh, of because of we've been using this virtual technology much more, uh, that is uh, something that you can increasingly uh, that you increasingly see at meetings that the voices of young people, of women, of people in the field are being heard more. And I think that's something that can be much improved. Uh, we can take much more steps as, as far as that's uh, uh, further steps as far as that's concerned. Um, and uh, make meetings just more interesting and not just uh, a list of statements uh, that are being, uh, that are endlessly being, being read. And I think they want to, but, you know, it's, you know, they're also, also being held back, you know, by, uh, by budget, by more conservative members, like the negotiation that I did, that I just talked about on finance, uh, I had invited representatives of civil society to be in uh, inside the meeting, but then there's always a country 
that finds the rules and regulations that say that actually, according to Article 69.7 first dot, you can't do that. And so it's also an organization that is huge and, um, and it's, it's, it's difficult, difficult to, to change sometimes. I see another hand, but no yeah, name. Matea, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's Matea. Sorry, it doesn't say my name. Um, I have a question about the negotiations, a bit more specifically. Um, do you have like a strategy for this or like a tactic that you say, for example, patience is key or I don't know, you have to go in with quite high, high demands and then like back down a bit or you say like you go in quite friendly and then like, I don't know, like is there any like <laughs> you uh, recommend or so? Well, I think it's, it's a very good question and it really depends also on the type uh, of, uh, of negotiation. Uh, and I could see Lisa in the chat box probably also wants to add something to this, but it really depends also on the type of negotiation. And we haven't even talked about that yet, but also all these negotiations are now virtually. So the negotiation that I took up, which again is so interesting about the about the UN together with my colleague from Fiji. Now, when on earth is somebody from the Netherlands going to do such a, you know, such an intensive process with somebody from Fiji? So that's what I really like. Uh, we talked, we had a strategy. Uh, we had very little time. We basically had only two um, rounds of formal negotiations, both virtually. So there was no possibility, you know, when you have in-person negotiations to say, okay, let's stop. And you go and talk to these two or three people and say, well, why don't you talk to that one? And we'll get there. So negotiating virtually is much, much more complicated, I think. And we were um, we had very little time. We had decided that what we were going to do, and that's your question, was to aim high. Because we said, you know, it's 2021. The world is hit by COVID, you know, which is not just a health pandemic, but it's also really impacted very um, deeply in the socioeconomic situation in mostly the more vulnerable countries, the low-income countries, the small island countries. And so we knew uh, that it would be easy to just come up with a draft that basically reflects consensus. But then you know that from that, you will be negotiated down. So we aimed high, knowing that we were going to be negotiated down, but that we'd end up at a more, with a more ambitious document then when we would first sort of uh, right from the start say, well, okay, I think we can get agreement on that. It was even my own country, the Netherlands that asked like, are you, are you mad? You sort of put out a draft that has at least 10 red lines for your own country. And of course I knew, but we did it. We did it on purpose because we knew we were going to be negotiated down. So because we only had two uh, formal negotiation moments. We spend a lot of time prior to the negotiations, basically talking to well, all, all, all groups of member states or individual member states to get a, a bit of an idea of where, of where they stood and where we could possibly reach, um, reach a compromise. But in this case, the, 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 the strategy was aim high because you'll be negotiated down and we wanted to come up with a document that would be would do justice to the times that we're living in. Lisa, anything to add? You thought it was an exciting question, right? Yeah, no, I, I really love the question because it's, um, yeah, it is very exciting and it really depends on, on a lot of things as well, I think. It depends on the topic in the commission or the, the process that you're negotiating in. Um, it depends on what the minister wants from us. So, you know, they also get to dictate a little bit what should be a priority for us. For example, a couple of years ago when we still had Liliana Pluma as our minister for, for foreign development, she was really super activist about um, SRHR. And that's something that we can still sort of trickle, see, see trickling down in our current policy. Um, but it also, you know, depends on, on how I think you can aim um, and how high you think you, can, you, you think you can aim and, and, and what you think is um, 
uh, yeah, reachable. So there's a lot yeah. of different factors that come together. It's also, you know, sometimes we have to first negotiate the EU position and then one country represents all of us as an entire EU. And I remember a couple months ago, there was a negotiation in the Human Rights Council in Geneva and we had discussed um, an EU position. And then, you know, as Netherlands, you're like, okay, we can sit back a little bit because we have this other country negotiating on behalf of us. And then hours before the negotiations were about to start, one of the other EU countries broke the um, uh, the position, and suddenly we had to negotiate in our in our own uh, national capacity. And we're like, what's going on, you know? And then suddenly it's just chaos, and you have to sort of scramble together <laughs> still to formulate your own position, which before you didn't need to do. Uh, so I think it's always very dynamic, and it always depends on a lot of things. Um, and we have a lot of strategies, I think, but we we always kind of make our way, yeah, our way out. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's a very important uh, addition, Lisa, because, you know, there's a real difference between, you know, negotiating from a national position, which we very often do on a lot of issues through the European Union, and the type of negotiation that I did, where you basically negotiate on behalf of the member states. So almost you have to sort of re leave your national position behind and, you know, come to consensus among the 193 countries, which is a difference because in your own national position, you can basically stick your position. If you if you negotiate on behalf of the entire of all the member states, you've got to take into account all the different uh, ideas. And I must say, I, when I was asked to do this uh, particular negotiation, I hesitated a little bit because I had just arrived and I, it, it, I knew it was going to be a tough uh, negotiation on a difficult uh, on a difficult subject, you know, finance and debt and all these kind of issues. Um, but um, I'm 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 glad I did it because I mean you go through a really steep learning curve and you really by doing such an intense process you really get to know uh, the dynamics between the different groups and, and and countries as well. So it's been really I think for me it's been really good. Thank you. All right. You. I think Elena also had a question. Yeah, um, my question is about transparency because um, you mentioned that during COVID times there are less hallway meetings. And does that increase the transparency when you have to plan like an actual meeting between diplomats? Like, does it help to, I don't know, yeah, increase the transparency basically? It's <laughs> oh, a very good question. I, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think that because, you know, when you have these uh, more formal negotiations, like I, like I said, then very often um, people are very polite. Huh? And so if you when we done when we did the first round, you almost think, well, piece of cake, you know, because people uh, are very polite, but they don't really uh, show all their cards. So uh, you still, even though you have this formal meeting and everybody can see each other on the screen and hear each other, you still have to then follow up and say, well, but, you know, what did you, what, did, what were you actually trying to say? Because, I mean, people are just in these open meetings too polite, almost too nice to each other. Not always, but that was the case in this negotiation. Uh, to um, uh, still, as part of the game, not to give away your position uh, in the first round of negotiations entirely. So I don't think in terms of transparency uh, that this way of working uh, has, has improved things a lot, no. Uh, thank you, I, I do have a, another question actually, because when we went to Armenia uh, on a trip with the Dansa, I think two years ago, we went to the ambassador um, um, to, uh, from the Netherlands to Armenia. And he told us that, uh, or I, I guess it was Georgia, I'm oh, sorry. But um, he told us that there's like a Dutch way of doing the negotiations. I was wondering if, if that's true, like that we are very open or like kind of rude almost. Is, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, it's true. I mean, we are, we are known to be very straightforward uh, as, uh, uh, when it comes to outlining our positions. But I think you always have to really think about what will get you what you want. And sometimes that really works by being 
straightforward and you know really sort of making the point and being very uh very firm and sometimes that will not get you what you want so then you'll have to just take a step back and say okay let me first listen what's going on yeah uh, maybe one step at a time rather than going immediately for the result uh, uh that i want but I, I i would agree that the sort of it's a little bit in the dutch dna to be very straightforward and get straight down to business i mean in a lot of other cultures you don't do that i mean you can't i can't imagine from my time in africa to enter an office and say well okay i'd like to talk about the following issue no you sit down and you say well how are you how's the family how is this how is that and then finally so we we are in that sense um, uh, yeah we're we're direct and straightforward and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and you need to really read the situation to then understand which which part which tool you should take out of your toolbox is it the one that you like most the straightforward one or do you have to take another one that will uh, that will work better in that specific situation okay, thank you for answering my question mm -hmm. okay anybody else i think if you have time for for one oh i see maya has a question as well sure yeah yeah one more and lisa can take one some more as well yeah maya yes um i was wondering if there are any parts of your job that you think are hard like that are a bit tougher than the others um so maybe my question is what do you think is the hardest part of your job um What is the hardest part? I mean, there is things that naturally come easier, and things that because I'm a, a by, I'm by nature a person that you know likes to uh, sort of convince with arguments and try to persuade people. And so, uh, what I don't like very much if you have to really play hardball, uh, because that's not really my my style. Of operating and sometimes you have to you just have to be square and i remember when i came for my courtesy call uh, with the uh, ambassador of the russian federation and the first thing he said was well i don't want to talk about mh17 well i mean then of course you have to say well i'm sorry that's not possible because this is an issue and we need to talk about it but it's these kind of more confrontational um, issues that i don't like uh, very much because it, it, it's, it's not my style and what is sometimes extremely boring, but that's not hard, is then you have to sit in the, in the, in the General Assembly Hall and listen to uh, 10, uh, 10 statements that are more or less all, all the same. But I think what I find hardest is um, getting people along who don't want to work for consensus, but are very confrontational and are not very interested in reaching common grounds because that requires you then to basically also use the same style a little bit because you won't get anywhere with, with, with those people. So that's what I find difficult. And I see Kaisha and then maybe uh, uh, if, if um, Lisa, do you have some, some 10 minutes after I left if there are still questions for you? Yeah, definitely. Okay, good. Please, Kaisa. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for this very inspirational talk. Um, the question I like to ask people who are in the field I want to get into, and also other fields, um, is: Is there any opportunity that we have today, as as adolescents, that you would recommend um, for getting into your field? Um, well, I mean. Uh, you mean diplomacy or development or what, what is your exact question? Well, both really, because what yeah. I hear from most diplomats is learn as many languages as possible and move to yeah. as many countries as possible. <laughs> so anything more concrete, no. maybe? No, I, 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 don't think, I don't think it works that way. I think, first of all, you've got to have a real passion for the, uh, 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 for the subject matter. You've got to be driven. Uh, you've got to be driven by it. And obviously, uh, I mean, in diplomacy, you, it's all about it's all about language. So you do need to speak at least two 
languages. Uh, I mean, English, in English and French. Uh, of course, you know, some uh, some people have specific uh, expertise that 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 we need in the ministry. So for a while, we had too few Chinese speakers, too few Russian speakers, and then you really try to also get uh, uh, get more of these people within within the uh, the ministry. I think just um, uh, showing uh, an interest in, in in the actual field and being able to show um, that you've worked on it and it doesn't have to be speaking six languages. It doesn't have to be, you know, visiting, visiting all the continents. It could also be that you, you know, you volunteered somewhere or you, um, you picked up, uh, uh, you did a course or a study or, uh, but I think anything that shows that your commitment to the subject matter uh, is, is, is going to work. But there's no such thing like you speak three languages and you visit it uh, uh, all over the world and you'll be, uh, you'll be in. I think you really have to go for, you know, what, uh, uh, how can I demonstrate that this is what I want to do? And there's very different ways of doing that. And I think we're also looking at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, especially now in my period as, as Secretary General, we're really also looking for a diverse workforce. So you're looking for uh, people with different backgrounds, you know, with different specialities, with different, because otherwise, I mean, if we all get the same people in, in our ministry, we won't be able to have any sort of proper discussion because we would all agree with each other uh, anyway. So this diversity uh, of the workforce in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is a really important issue. So there is no blueprint because I mean, we're not looking for blueprint people, not anymore. Thanks. All right, I guess um, I'm going to have to uh, leave you, but I mean, if you still have questions for Lisa, I'm sure yeah, she's I, I still, still, uh, still able to answer those, but let me just say, good, let me just say goodbye. And uh, thank you, I really enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for your time this evening. I was late, so I haven't learned what is the soft power the Dutch government imposes in the UN. I was really questioning that. What's the soft power you the Dutch government uses? I, I think you have maybe... gone, so I'll just I'll yeah. just take that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we were talking about this a little bit before, so I'll, I'll just keep it short and sweet, so I don't you know repeat myself. Um, but the things that we usually do in the UN are, are norm setting, right? So really uh, looking at what we think are, are priorities, what are priorities for our ministry and for the minister as well, that, you know, the priorities that they set for, for the four years of their term. Um, and uh, yeah, like the UN doesn't have a lot of hard power because it depends on the power that it gets sort of in loan from its member states. It doesn't have, you know, an army, it doesn't have, any sort of legislative um, power beyond the Security Council. And even then there's countries that wanna take that into question. So I think, you know, just going to commissions and really putting ourselves out there and, and thinking up about the things that we think are important are the best we can do. And we do it quite well. Um, but yeah, I think that, that would probably be the best answer. Um, and yeah, just to making sure that, that I don't repeat myself from earlier. And I think I actually wanted to add something to Yoko's answer about, uh, you know, how you can get into BASET or the ministry and, and that there's not a really blueprint. I think probably the most important uh, thing that you need to have is, is be authentic and really have um, your own story and really also answer the question for yourself. Why do you want to work for the Dutch government? What, what is it about Dutch, a Dutch identity or, um, uh, you know, the Dutch way of doing things that you want to represent that? in another country. Because also imagine, right, if, imagine if you vote GroenLinks and suddenly we have um, a far right cabinet, it's just a possibility. I, I don't see it happening anytime soon, but you know, could be, then would you still be able to represent that policy that a far right minister would give to you? You know, and if the answer is no, then you can still join, but you'd have to ask yourself, how long do I want to stay then? Um, and, I think a lot of people also think it's all about, you know, security policy and politics, but the things that I mostly work on, which are, you know, they're called social development are also very political. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can, you can be working on 
Um, and at the same time, it doesn't all depend on what the minister prescribes to the policies that you want to, to see, because they give you like, maybe like 10 pages or 100 pages about what they want to see for the next coming years. But then there's so much space that you can get. So even if there's a, a policy you don't necessarily agree with, there's space for you to sort of give your own arguments on how, how you think that the Dutch policy should look and, and what we should do to tackle a certain issue. Um, so I just wanted to add that as well to, to her answer. Thank you. No Are there any more questions for Lisa? Otherwise, I have a question for you. Um, we talked a lot about gender equality. And um, of course, the Netherlands is a, is a rather progressive country uh, on that front internationally. But I was wondering what the situation at the, at the ministry is in that regard. Is it still a lot of uh, old men? You mean... <laughs> okay, so you mean internally. Well, yes. And so I am in a position to talk about this where I think a lot of my colleagues wouldn't be. Um, I think, so we have departments, right, within the ministry. There's four director generals. Yoko used to be the director general for international corporation. And then there is um, political affairs, there's European affairs, and there's economic affairs. And so I think within my director general, um, we're quite progressive and, you know, we really embrace all of these things. But like I said before, the median age at the ministry is 55. And it's still, you know, I don't, I don't know about the, the gender um, balance, but the other day we had uh, like internal sort of a week of, of um, sessions about how to take the ministry forward. And I think a couple of sessions were only manned by men. And there was quite a lot of backlash on this. Like, are we, is this, is this for real? We're, we're putting five older men to talk about the future of the ministry, you know? And, but I think people are critical of that and there's space to be critical of that as well. Um, so I definitely won't say that we're perfect, but we're, we're getting there. And I mean, we, you know, we have to be, we have an ambassador, like I'm a youth ambassador, but we have an ambassador for women's rights and gender equality. And I really don't think you can do that justifiably, um, if you also don't look on the inside. Yeah, we, we happened to, uh, have spoken with her, uh, two weeks ago, oh, actually. Pascal, uh, yes, yeah. Love very, her. very nice lecture as well. Um, if there are any more questions, otherwise, I would like to very much thank you uh, for your time. No and I would briefly give the word to uh, Matea from SIP Amsterdam to tell us something about the next uh, lecture. Yeah, um, our next lecture on soft powers is on Monday, the 3rd of May, so in a couple of days already at 7. And yeah, we have Dorit Kohl coming, who's going to talk about contemporary uh, conflict dynamics and the role of soft powers there. So yeah, we hope to all see you all there.